-hmm. They just exist in your body. They're there. They're kind of mm -hmm. like a little illness in your body mm -hmm. somewhere in a little pocket. Yeah, and there are other yeah. types of cancers that will eventually yeah. um, become a problem. You take over. But you just have to figure, okay, wait, at what point do you, do you start? Welcome to the monthly webinar presented by Pro Bono Partnership of Atlanta. We want to begin by thanking Georgia Legal Services for hosting this webinar and making it available on its website. My name is Ann Andrews, and this is Tim Phillips, and we'll be talking today about the legal and tax issues associated with social enterprises. The uh, mission of Pro Bono Partnership of Atlanta is to provide free legal assistance to community-based nonprofits that serve low-income or disadvantaged individuals. We match eligible organizations with volunteer lawyers who can, from the leading corporations and law firms in Atlanta who can assist nonprofits with business law matters. The, just briefly to go over eligibility, uh, in order to be a client of the Pro Bono Partnership, your organization must be a 501c3 nonprofit, must be located in or serve the greater Atlanta area, you must serve low-income or disadvantaged individuals, and must be unable to afford legal services. You can visit us on the web at www.pbatl.org for pro bono partnerships uh, to get more information. So to start off, one of the main questions that uh, we need to talk about is what is social enterprise? There are a lot of definitions and it's actually a new enough concept that uh, there isn't one accepted definition for it. Um, one I like to use is the use of market-based strategies to solve social problems. As you can see from the definition, it incorporates aspects of business and nonprofit in one. Nonprofits have become interested in social enterprise recently because it presents an opportunity to diversify income sources and also to generate some income. And it's sort of this, and while nonprofits can be either, uh, or while social enterprises can be either nonprofits or businesses, uh, they will be talking about the nonprofit form of social enterprise. Moving on to uh, slide five, a couple of examples of social enterprise right here in Atlanta. One is the Georgia Justice Project, which uh, its mission is to help clients who've been accused of crime and follow those clients throughout whatever may happen to them. Um, oftentimes, people are coming out of jail, and the Georgia Justice Project found that it was very difficult for people to get jobs straight out of jail with criminal records. So they started New Horizons Landscaping, which is a landscaping company that uh, where the people who are employed there are the clients of the Georgia Justice Project. It helps because the clients are able to acquire skills for the workforce, um, and also often become self-sufficient and assimilate back into society, especially if they're coming out of jail. As a plus, it generates income. So you can see where it's, where it's incorporating both aspects of business and nonprofit. Another example is Project Open Hand, which you may be familiar with. Uh, Open Hand provides nutritious meals to individuals who have chronic illnesses, seniors, other people who are unable to provide proper nutrition for themselves. Open Hand discovered that there actually was a market available for nutritious meals. Uh, a lot of busy professionals don't have time to cook. So Open Hand started a subsidiary called Good Measure Meals. Good Measure Meals is a for-profit and 100% of the profits go to Open Hand, to Project Open Hand to support its charitable mission. So it, again, you can see how a, an actual, there's actually a market available and uh, the profits that are generated by selling uh, services to people who can pay for them help Project Open Hand to provide services to people who cannot. Well, thank you, Anne. That's a good setup for the stage, uh, what we're going to talk about. And we'll move into risk and rewards. We, we understand now, uh, at least from Anne's overview, what social enterprise is all about and how certain organizations have gone about incorporating an enterprise approach into their charitable mission. Uh, some of the things that we're going to talk about today are the legal risks that surround engaging in social enterprise or business activities to further your charitable purposes, and also some of the tax issues that come about when uh, an 
an organization that is exempt from federal income taxation engages in an activity that is commercial uh, in nature. Uh, one of the, the large-scale sort of uh, overview aspects of engaging in social enterprise or um, activity that are commercial in nature is under the test that an organization must meet in order to be considered charitable or, or exempt from taxation under Section 501c3 of the Internal Revenue Code is the, um, the ne necessity to operate in furtherance of your charitable purpose. So when you go to the IRS and ask for an exemption in the form of the application, you generally will describe what you intend to do. And uh, when the IRS writes you back a letter and says that they've determined that you are exempt, they will tell you that that exemption is conditioned upon uh, your activities that are strictly in furtherance of your uh, exempt purposes. So the term that you'll find in the, in the Revenue Code is actually exclusively. And, and um, there are some parameters that you can w operate within so that you can do things that are while we, they're commercial in nature, nonetheless further your exempt purposes. So that's a, that's a big um, overview that, that you need to uh, keep in mind. Another is that there are legal consequences in, um, involved with business activity, uh, and that might include losing your exempt status. So if you do have a determination from the IRS, you want to make sure that whatever activity you're engaging in doesn't jeopardize your loss of that exempt status. So one of the first things you want to do if you think social enterprise may be something you're interested in is pull out your articles of incorporation, have a look at your mission statement, pull your bylaws, and see, re-engage with whatever your mission is. And that's going to help you determine whether what you do as a social enterprise is related or not to your mission. And we'll talk about that, how that relates. We're on slide eight now. So the the issue with business activities, and by business activities we're talking about selling a service or a good, um, is that if you are a 501c3 tax exempt organization, you cannot engage in unrelated business activities that are too substantial in relation to your charitable mission. Obviously, that begs the question. Um, the basic test is, if it's unrelated, it can't be too substantial. Related depends on whether what you're doing furthers your mission. So, for example, if your mission is to provide job skills training for the mentally disabled, and you decide that you want to start a program where a local business will pay uh, the mentally disabled individuals in your program to help assemble handicraft, for example, and this becomes a, a central part of you know, part of your program that you train mentally disabled individuals on how to uh, be a good employee, how to assemble these items, or um, and, and basically the idea being that they're going to gain skills and then go out into the workforce and be able to be self-sufficient, then even though you may be getting some income from those handicrafts being sold to the local business, that's probably considered related to your function because it actually does help further your mission of making mentally disabled individuals self-sufficient. So if it's related, it's okay. If it's not related, then the question becomes, is it substantial? Substantial is another difficult uh, question because the IRS has not provided any uh, right line test for exactly what is substantial. Numbers that are often thrown out are 15%, which people you know, will counsel you that if your uh, business activity is taking more than 15% of your time, or it may be bringing in more than 15% of your income, that's probably considered substantial. So this is a, why it's very important if you're considering this that you need to have legal counsel to talk about whether you may be uh, engaging in unrelated substantial activity. The problem with that is you jeopardize your tax exempt status. That's probably wor the worst thing that can happen for most nonprofits. So that's, that's ish one major issue that you're going to need to be concerned about um, and get past that threshold. So the idea is to really um, 
track the activity that you're engaging in. If it, if it is an activity that is not related to your exempt purposes, you want to keep track of not only the revenues that are generated by the activity, but as Ann mentioned, how much of your time and effort that you invest in that activity, because that's another way that the Internal Revenue Service will judge whether or not you're engaging in a substantial manner in an activity that's not related to your exempt purposes. Flipping over to slide nine. Assuming that you've decided, with the help of legal counsel, that you're not jeopardizing your 501c3 tax exempt status, the next consideration is whether you're going to be subject to what we call UBIT. UBIT stands for the Unrelated Business Income Tax. As a 501c3, one of the major benefits that you have right now is not having to pay income tax. If you are earning money from a trade or business that is something you're carrying on on a regular basis and that is not substantially related to your purpose, then you are going to have to pay the income tax on that income from that business at the normal corporate tax rate. There are some exclusions and it's somewhat complicated, but the basic test here are, are you carrying on this activity regularly? Regularly is another question that's a little bit up in the air as far as what does it mean to be regularly carrying on an activity. One example might be, if your organization is selling ice cream for two days at an annual fair, for example, and you're raising money from ice cream sales, that's probably not going to be considered regularly carrying on, in which case you might not be considered subject to the UBIT, the Unrelated Business Income Tax. If, on the other hand, an organization such as an animal shelter offers, say, round the clock, round your, all year round pet boarding, grooming services to the general public that they can pay for, that's probably considered regularly carried on and income from that might be subject to taxation. It might be helpful just in terms of how to understand why the tax exists. The history of the tax is that Congress enacted it because there were non-profit or tax-exempt organizations who were engaging in business activities and since they didn't have to pay tax on the revenues that were generated by that, they were operating at what was deemed to be an unfair competitive advantage to the for-profit businesses that were engaging in the same types of commercial activities. And so Congress looked at it and said, yes, that's really not fair that if you're tax-exempt, you've got an advantage over for-profit so that the tax came into play and they did enact certain exclusions from it. So to pick up from some of Ann's examples, you might find that while your sale of ice cream could be carried on and even on a regular basis so that you're having an event almost every month, if those sales are only by volunteers, if the activities themselves are undertaken by volunteers, if the products themselves are donated to your enterprise, it really does take on the nature of a fundraiser and it is not even though there's a quote-unquote business activity taking place, someone is buying a product from your organization, it's really undertaken in a manner to generate funds for the organization and doesn't have that sort of unfair competition aspect to it unlike another example of, say, boarding pets. Well, that's clearly an activity that's engaged in by for-profit organizations and you can see where there would be an unfair advantage to an organization that doesn't have to pay tax on its revenues if it's offering the same types of services notwithstanding its exempt purposes. I have a question. Is renting out facilities during non-program hours considered taxable income? The question about renting your facilities during non-program related activities or time is an interesting one because with rent, there is a general exclusion. So, for example, if you own a piece of property as an exempt organization and you rent that facility to someone for their use for whatever the purpose may be, you could say, well, I'm just receiving rent from an activity and there's an exclusion from that in the revenue code. It gets more complicated, however, when you 
uh, take into account that rent, uh, first off, you have to find out or, or figure out whether your building has been financed with debt. So if you borrowed money to construct a facility and then rented it out, it wouldn't matter what kind of activity was taking place in the space, you would have to pay at least a portion of that rent. You'd have to pay tax on at least a portion of it. So keep in mind, first question to ask yourself when you're looking at rent, whether it's for a real property or personal property, is has there been a debt finance uh, activity here? Did I borrow money to buy the building? Um, another uh, situation exists when the activity itself is, is a for-profit activity. So you're looking at a business that's operating in your space. And you want to be careful there because the asset itself is supposed to be dedicated to exempt purposes. And if you're dedicating the asset to another purpose, then you may cross the line and actually be subject to a tax on the revenues generated from, uh, from the activity. But as a general rule, rents are excluded from, um, from taxation. What if you provide the services along with that rent? So the question, uh, another question has come up as to whether or not in combination with receiving rent, where you're just acting as a landlord, you actually provide some form of services to your tenant. Well there, now you're looking at a combination of activities. One is, on the, on the one hand, is sort of a passive role of I'm receiving rent from, uh, from, a, uh, from a tenant. The other is, I'm actually now a service provider. And so um, I've, I'm engaging in activities that are generating income to me because of the very nature of the activity, which could be management services, it could be um, activities related to um, that person's enterprise where you're, uh, you're helping them to make a profit. Um, I have seen it, however, where you can structure the agreement, the services, so that they are actually in furtherance of your exempt purposes. An example could be in the housing context, where you as a charitable partner are engaging in renting uh, residential uh, property for um, substantially below market rent. So you're helping people in the community who are um, distressed economically. If you also provide services to your tenants under a, uh, a management agreement, those services provide their in furtherance of your purposes, which means they're probably social or recreational or educational, um, to the extent you receive fees from that, you can actually um, exempt that money from uh, taxation. And I've structured arrangements like that so that charities can receive more income from their activities without having to pay tax. The other concern, obviously, is for, for the purposes of whether you need to pay tax, one of the questions is, are you regularly carrying on that activity? The other is, is it substantially related to your exempt purpose? Um, if it's not, you may be subject to the tax. And one thing to keep in mind here is a lot of organizations will say, well, it is related because I'm using that money to support you know, my nonprofit. Um, and while that makes sense, uh, in some, some respects, the IRS doesn't see it that way. So making money for our organization is not considered uh, um, substantially related to my purpose. It's the, the question is not what eventually happens with the money. The question is the nature of the activity itself. So using uh, the shelter activity, if you, if you had a, a, a shelter for, for pets who have been harmed or who are at risk of being harmed, and you also operated that center where people could board their pets, you couldn't argue that the activity was related because you were raising revenue to support the, the mission part of, of your enterprise. You would, you would still be subject to the tax more than likely because that activity is commercial in nature and isn't precisely uh, related to uh, protecting the animals from harm. A couple of uh, technical issues with the tax on unrelated business income. If you get a thousand or more taxable income in any uh, any year, any uh, tax period, you are subject to a tax filing, a separate filing. Um, it's a 990T, and that filing now, because of new rules and instructions, is a public document, so that it, it, it has to be made available to the general public. Um, also, it should be noted that in, if you're engaged in activity that generates uh, the um, unrelated business income and you're subject to tax on it, you also have available deductions and credits that would apply 
in the normal course of uh, income or revenue generating activities that for profits engage in. So it, it may sound bad, but you do have some ways of limiting your exposure to the, to the tax. We move on to slide 10, and we really don't have time to go into these today. But um, one thing to keep in mind is as long as you're not jeopardizing your, your taxes on purpose, it's not a terrible thing to pay uh, unrelated business income tax. But it doesn't mean uh, that you shouldn't engage in social enterprise. It can be a great way for nonprofits to diversify income and to help add additional funding streams, particularly in this economy. Um, we're seeing foundation sources of funding dry up. So it, it is necessary to get a little more creative. Um, in line with that, there are a couple more, there are a few more sophisticated ways of dealing with trying to avoid having to pay that, that unrelated business income tax or um, avoid jeopardizing your tax exempt status. And these are things that you would need to talk with an attorney about to decide whether they would make sense for you, but there are options in terms of uh, some organizations will establish for-profit subsidiaries. Um, for example, Project Open Hand did that with Good Measure Meals. You can uh, engage in partnerships with for-profits, and there's also a new concept called the L3C, which is a hybrid business nonprofit um, entity, and it's, it's not available yet in Georgia, but it, there's a lot of interest in it. Um, it's available in some states, and it may be something that we can look to in the future that would fit a little bit better the social enterprise model. Moving on to slide 11. Uh, and some of the areas where we see social enterprise are um, already sort of developed in terms of both the income tax treatment that you can expect and the legal ramifications of entering into them. Uh, there's three that we're going to talk about specifically, and, and uh, we'll start with cause-related marketing or cause marketing, and then talk about qualified sponsorships and also uh, concept that and touched on, and that's joint ventures, where you actually get into some form of a partnership or venture with for-profit entity. With cause marketing, and sort of bringing it down to its bare bones, it's really the ability to use someone's product promotion to promote your charitable mission. Uh, and we see this a lot. Um, it's probably one of the most common forms of social enterprise that's out there today. In fact, it's become such a common thread in our economy that some people may not even take note of it uh, when they come across it, but it is, it is very prevalent today. Another, and, and this is, uh, although the concept itself is not new, the tax rules around it are somewhat new, and that's known as a, that's known as a qualified uh, sponsorship, and a qualified sponsorship is really a way of a for a charity to provide a significant recognition, if you will, to a corporate sponsor or donor without crossing over the line into a taxable exercise or activity, which is advertising. Charities aren't permitted to advertise, per se, for commercial activities, but they can engage in what are known as qualified sponsorship. Um, and lastly, there's the joint venture. And joint ventures have been around for some time, and the law continues to develop around them. And so in, in this instance, particularly, I always advise clients to seek legal counsel and uh, even tax accounting counsel because some of the rules that govern joint ventures are quite complicated. The tax rules can get uh, pretty sticky and it doesn't do you any good to engage in an activity even though it's very supportive of your mission if it results in uh, either one, uh, an unrelated business income tax that you're not prepared to pay or even worse, the uh, loss of your exempt status. Um, so talking about cause-related marketing in a little more detail, uh, and again, unfortunately, the time doesn't permit us to go into too much detail here, but I'm going to hit the highlights. Uh, the central elements that you'll see in any cause marketing relationship are, one, it does involve some form of a for-profit business and a charitable cause. So those, you're going you're gonna to expect to see that. Um, another element is it usually uh, involves some kind of a specific campaign or promotion. And the campaign could last for 
some duration uh, as, as well as the promotion. But the idea is that there is, there is an activity that's somewhat specific in nature, either around a product or uh, a campaign of products that involves the promotion of uh, obviously a, a for-profit um, wares and a charity's mission. Uh, and it, another element is that you would see this marketing approach to charitable giving. So um, what's, what's a common phrase to see is that a, a company is, um, is doing well by doing good. Uh, we see that expression a lot. So if, uh, for example, a company that makes the cereal and produces cereal and promotes the cereal by saying we we provide uh, some portion of our profits on each sale of this this product to uh, a specific charity. They are advancing their um, their commercial interests obviously by promoting the product, but they're also showing that they're aligned with the charity and promoting its cause. Um, and finally, one of the, uh, the other elements that you'll see is in terms of the structure, and this is important to note because it, it does uh, relate back to the unrelated business income tax, you'll see in these arrangements that the payment structure is typically arranged so that the money that flows to the charity comes in the form of a royalty. And royalties are, are specifically excluded from the tax on unrelated business income. So by having a stream of income in the form of a royalty, the charity is able to benefit from the activity, associate itself with a good corporate partner, and yet not have to pay uh, any unrelated business income tax on revenues that are generated from the campaign. Um, some of the ways you'll see this undertaken, I, I would think the most common, and it, 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 while it doesn't appear on the, the slide, it's probably because it's so common we, we see it, and that's really just a straight up product sale or promotion. Company A is selling a product and or promoting its product, and some portion of those proceeds are going to end up in Charity B's pockets. And that's where, where we really see uh, a lot of cause marketing or cause-related marketing campaign uh, structure. The other type is a product partnership, where in our example here, we've got a, 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 a company that's saying, if you save uh, the lids from our product, uh, and turn them in, then we will um, provide some form of income stream to a charity that we know is engaged in a life-saving mission. So there, the, the campaign is taken on a different flavor. There's some activity required of the participants beyond simply purchasing the product. Um, another format you can see out there is what's known as a certification. And um, one of the, the more common um, certifications we see out there is the American Heart Association has a heart check. And so a product may have a heart check on that and that is actually involves not only the product or the provider of the product going through um, the commercial activity of promoting their, their, um, their product, it also involves the charity going through its own process to check off that product as being consistent. So you see, again, closer ties to uh, product uh, partnership with charitable promotion. The other is um, what we call a product branding, and that's really where the cause marketing campaign takes on a brand of its own. And the most common one today uh, that we see out in commercial space is what's known as product red, and that is its own brand. And so a commercial um, venture or comes in or a commercial enterprise comes in and says, we want to put that on our product, and for that right, they will pay uh, a royalty. Um, That's actually, Product Red, um, as we were talking about, has actually been extremely successful, but you've seen more and more companies sign on, and big companies, you're talking about Apple, Gap, um, you know, Starbucks even, so you'll, you've actually seen more and more familiar products getting this Product Red logo and certification on it, and it's a perfect example of a win-win. It's worked out very well for the charity, it's also worked out very well for the company. Um, and since you know, none of these things don't come without their set of complexities, I want to mention that before one engages in any kind of cause-related marketing campaign, it really is important that you consult with legal counsel. 
There are a myriad of state laws and regulations that could come into play here, uh, the most common of which is the regulation on what are known as uh, commercial co-venturers. Uh, this could this would require um, anywhere from uh, an, a specific registration with the state on the part of both the charity and the commercial enterprise uh, to actually filing the agreement. Some states would require you to file whatever agreement you have. Uh, and, and I would strongly encourage any charity that's looking to, to engage in a commercial enterprise or social enterprise to have an agreement, no matter what it is, somehow you need to get on paper what it is that the two partners uh, are going to engage in and what the rights and duties and responsibilities are. Because without that, if something should go wrong, you won't have anything to rely on to show that the other party had agreed to a certain thing. So that comes into play here specifically because state laws may require it. So be careful when you, when you engage in the activity to ensure that before you step foot into the commercial space, tied up everything to a specific agreement uh, where everything's laid out. And we have a question. Mm -hmm. um, should nonprofits also worry about the fundraising registration and then also reporting in multiple states? The question uh, relates to a topic that I'm touching on here, and that is, mm -hmm. do nonprofits need to worry about state registration for fundraising, um, charitable promotions, and the like? And the answer is yes. Because uh, when it comes down to it, the state attorney general that regulate this activity for the most part, and that's where you find this kind of regulatory um, requirement, are looking after charitable assets. And so they're looking at charity. So if you are going to engage in activity, and, and this could be as simple as any, any a, a fundraising campaign, let's set aside commercial activity for, for a moment. If you're engaging in um, fundraising activity and it's on a, a broad scale, you definitely should be registered. Um, and if there's any question in your mind about how to go about it, consult with an attorney. Uh, the Pro Bono Partnership of Atlanta can provide you counsel in that regard. And you can go on the web and you can actually learn about what the requirements are for your specific state. Georgia's very good, it's user friendly. Uh, what is required of you as a charity to register? So the answer to the question about charities being worried about fundraising activity is a strong yes. And if you engage in one of these types of activities you've described, and it crosses over, say, into Florida or Alabama, if you're located in Georgia, do you need to also then register in those other states where it may bleed over into other states? You know, the, the question is sort of picking up on that last one. If you, if you do engage in activities and you, and you deem that, in fact, you do need to register in the state where your primary activity occurs, what happens when there's bleed over, when, you, when your campaign or your activity spread out beyond the jurisdiction that you're located in, and there's another jurisdiction where you're, you're engaging in, in the activity, and, and the answer to that question is yes, you need to look at that jurisdiction, figure out what their fundraising requirements and registration requirements are, and uh, similarly register to do so. I can tell you from my experience that the, um, the fees, the application process, really are not anywhere near, they're not burdensome, they're not onerous. It, it really is a matter of filling out a form and providing certain information about your organization and it's um, those who are uh, insiders, the directors and the officers. But the fees aren't high and it really does you so much good to have that done versus getting a call from the Attorney General's office that's conducting an investigation and why you're raising money in the state without registering, um, so that, you know, there's a very, very small amount of pain for a large reward. Do you know the name of the website with the um, laws and legal implications for the charitable registration? No, the, the question is, do we, do we have the, uh, the website for the, uh, for state registration requirements, and I'm assuming that this must be in the the state of Georgia. Mm -hmm. uh, I typically have gone to the Secretary of State. Mm -hmm. Uh, office, they have a charitable um, section, charitable entity section on the Secretary of State um, website that can lead you to where you need to go for those forms. And I think we'll probably move to the next type of um, commercial or social enterprise. Uh, and this is known as a qualified sponsorship. A qualified sponsorship really 
is you, uh, as a charity, taking money, uh, some form of a payment, from a corporate donor, and in return for that, um, providing them with a significant amount of recognition. So uh, what we see a lot uh, in the space are uh, if you're having a seminar or a conference, some form of public event, uh, or an event that's going to be attended by your members if you're a membership organization, you might bring in a sponsor or several sponsors. Perhaps you're going to have levels of sponsors. And in exchange for a payment, uh, that sponsor would get some name recognition. They might get um, some kind of ability to provide the audience with material. Um, but the limitations that exist here really revolve around um, the exclusion. There's an exclusion for this type of activity in the Internal Revenue Code. It's relatively new uh, from the uh, tax on unrelated business income. And that exclusion is centered on whether or not what you're providing in exchange for that payment constitutes advertising. Advertising is promoting someone else's product or service. So if you're using qualitative language or um, you're providing your audience with some specific details or a call to act or buy, purchase that person or that entity's product, then you cross over the line of advertising versus acknowledgement. It is absolutely fine to acknowledge your good corporate donors, and you should. Um, but you cannot advertise for them. So you have to be careful of the statements you make about them and their product. And um, you also want to be careful not to put materials out that are, are um, somehow pushing your members or your audience to purchasing uh, those products. And um, one thing of note is that if a uh, corporate sponsor's logo or trademark if their material, their intellectual property that you're going to use on your, on your um, handouts or whatever it is associated with your activity contains some kind of qualitative statement. Uh, one of good examples is Coke is it. I think it's, it's one of their... That's fine because it's actually embedded in their logo and all you're doing is allowing them to display their logo. But if you take another step and put information about that uh, product or service that's qualitative in nature, then you really have engaged in what is known as advertising. And the outcome for you is not so much that you are, are going to lose your status as a charity, uh, assuming that this isn't all you're doing. Um, the outcome is, is more than likely that a portion of that payment is going to be deemed to be advertising and you'll be subject to be bid on it. So that's where you want to exercise some caution. I'm going to move over to 514 and joint ventures. Joint venture activity um, is perhaps the most interesting and uh, I would say the, 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 the type of activity that has the most um, um, opportunity for a, a charitable enterprise and yet it has the most risk. Because once you start down the road of uh, engaging in a partnership with an organization, then you really have taken the step of um, being a, a part of the risk of the activity in which you are engaging. So uh, if, if you structure your venture so that you lack sufficient control over the uh, exercise, over, the, over whatever the activity is, and your for-profit um, joint venturer who is clearly motivated by uh, uh, earning as much revenue as they, as they can, that's, that's generally how for profits work, you can really get into a bad place um, as an organization, both in terms of what you may be risking uh, on your uh, taxation and, of course, uh, the potential to have your status revoked. Um, there are types of ventures that you can that you, um, come across in this space. One of them is known as a whole venture. And Whole venture really is what it sounds like. You, as a charitable organization, are contributing all of your assets into this venture. And the for profit, of course, is putting in its assets. And so you've created this new uh, entity 
of which you are a partner. And uh, there are lots of risks associated with that because the enterprise itself is obviously going to be some mixture of what the two organizations engaged in prior to coming together. And since one of them was a for-profit, you've added that um, additional risk that your activity could be deemed to be only in furtherance of that for-profit partner's uh, enterprise. So um, a significant amount of risk, there are IRS rulings in this area that specify the kinds of structures and the, uh, the what needs to be in place to protect the charity's interests. Now, because they're issued by the IRS, they're, um, they tend to be black and white, and uh, we know that in, in the real world, everything is not black and white. And so this is an area where I think it is absolutely critical. In fact, I wouldn't allow any charity that uh, asked me to engage in any kind of enterprise as a joint venture without their own legal counsel. So uh, that's a warning that if someone comes to you um, as a for-profit and says, I really would like to come together as a, as a joint venture, they all gonna, they're more than likely going to have counsel. That counsel shouldn't be your counsel because they have a different interest uh, and they're, they should be barred anyway ethically uh, because of the conflict that exists between the parties. So please, if you are considering this, get your own counsel so you understand the risks that are, are there for you. With that said, there are lots and lots of advantages to, to bringing in a joint venture. You'll have access to capital that you wouldn't otherwise have. Um, you can actually further your mission in a very efficient manner. Um, the whole venture, again, is designed to further an activity that you're already engaging in and just do it in a manner that perhaps touches more, uh, more people and, and more things. And there's a question. So I have two questions. The first one says, regarding advertising, is it okay for a nonprofit to offer members a discount on a particular company's products as a member's benefit? So in this case, the discount is provided by the company as, um, as a way to support the nonprofit. So we're going back to advertising activity, and the idea is that uh, a company or a charity would offer its membership uh, or its members some form of a discount on a commercial product. Uh, and while that's that's really not advertising per se for the for the company, you, you effectively have a, a separate enterprise that's offering its product at a at a discounted level for members. That could be really deemed to be a part of whatever benefits a member of that organization gets. It's the access to products. Uh, where you get into danger, I think, is where there's a, there's a specific offering of, for example, a coupon for that company. Because a coupon is clearly uh, designed to entice someone to go to a business, use the coupon to buy their product. And the IRS, an informal um, advice has provided that in the nature of um, a, in a charity's business or in their charitable activity, if they are providing coupons as part and parcel of other material that relate to um, um, say a convention or a trade show or something like that, the provision of those coupons could actually be considered advertising. So you want to exercise care there. Uh, and there was another part to the question. Oh, this is a separate question. Oh, there's a yeah. separate question. What are some of the pitfalls if two nonprofits enter into a joint venture? The question is two nonprofits entering into a joint venture. That can get complicated, but like Tim says, the most important thing is you need to get an agreement. You need to have something in writing. Yeah. The pitfalls I've seen, and I've done these, um, these deals, and they really don't have to be complicated. It could be a straightforward letter agreement. Uh, specific to an, uh, a certain activity where two charities, for example, are going to engage in something, or we could even have a, a, a non-charity, uh, say it's a 501c6, which is a business league or, or um, chamber of commerce, that see that there's a there's an activity that would benefit both of the organizations where they can engage in this together. The important thing, and correctly noted, is that the that there be an agreement in place between the two entities, uh, even if it's simple terms, but that that agreement reflects what each party expects to put into and get out of that um, that venture. Since it should be um, clear that if two 
non-profit organizations are engaging in an activity together, that activity should be furthering the purposes of both. You shouldn't have the same types of risk that you would uh, in the context of engaging in a partnership or venture with a for-profit. In other words, you shouldn't be uh, putting yourself at risk of, of the loss of your exempt status. But the risk still exists if you are engaging now as two nonprofits in what could be deemed a commercial enterprise. So if you're going to get together to sell things, if that's still not related to either of your of your uh, purposes, you're you're at risk that you'd have to pay the tax on unrelated business income. Again, that's not evil. Doesn't mean you shouldn't do it. You just have to make sure you pay it uh, so that you, you avoid the risk that the IRS will audit you and, and hit you with penalties and interest down the road. Um, I wanted to finish up with joint ventures. It's a huge topic, but there's some core elements of it that the IRS absolutely will expect to see. And that's whether or not you engage in a whole venture, which I talked about, uh, charity puts in everything, uh, versus an ancillary joint venture, so that you're, this is an activity that is um, it's not everything you're doing, but you're engaging in a significant manner. You are uh, putting some of your assets at risk uh, by engaging in the venture. But what the IRS really want to see is they'll want to see that that venture, whether it's whole or ancillary, is in furtherance of your exempt purposes. So that's number one. Um, to engage in, a, in strictly uh, an activity to generate income because you see the profitability of it, has nothing to do with your exempt purposes. Um, that's extremely risky, and if it, if it crosses over that substantial um, barrier, then you've um, not only put yourself in a taxable situation, but you've also put yourself at risk of losing your exempt status. So make sure that the activity does further your exempt purposes. Second, make sure that you are permitted as a charity to engage exclusively in activities that uh, further your purpose. So if the venture is engaging in a broad range of activities, your part of that should be the type of activity that furthers your particular purpose. And, and lastly, make sure that you can prevent that entity from engaging in activities that will cause you to lose your charitable status, put you at too much, too much risk of um, the IRS revoking your status. Um, what we've seen here and what's been voiced by the IRS is their chief concern when a charity engages in a joint venture is that there will be a significant private benefit to your for-profit partner, um, but it will be um, you'll have the charity exposed to an inordinate amount of risk. Uh, and we've seen this in a, in a, uh, in a big way in the charitable uh, partnerships that promote affordable housing. Tax uh, exempt charities whose mission it is to improve their communities engage in partnerships to develop housing that's rental uh, housing. Uh, for profit comes in, they're investors in the enterprise, that's really what their risk is. They put their capital in, they get back very, very attractive benefits in the form of tax credits. And if they structure the arrangement so that the, uh, so that the charity is putting its assets at risk and providing all these guarantees on the profitability and the tax credits and all the private uh, benefits that are supposed to flow, then the IRS will say that is too much. The charity is not, um, doesn't have the same or the right balance between furthering its purpose versus the private benefits to the uh, for profit partner. We talked, Go ahead. We talked a little bit about ways to mitigate, but there's some more creative structural ways of mitigating some of the risks that you may come across, and we're not going to get into the complicated nitty-gritty of that, but um, Tim has some uh, suggestions for you. Well, yeah, and these are really uh, related to limiting your exposure to the unrelated business income tax. Um, I, look at, I broke it down into four sort of major categories. One is look at your purpose. Um, and mentioned that if the activity is related, then you, you're taking yourself out of the basket. Uh, because again, the first part of unrelated business income tax is unrelated. And if it's related to what you're doing, then you've got the very strong position that you shouldn't be subject to tax. Um, you're furthering your purposes. The other is activity. Look at the scope and the nature of the activities in which you're engaging. How, how, uh, how 
how often do they occur? Is it something that can be limited? Um, and then there are specific exclusions. You can structure your activity so that the payment streams that come from that activity are will fit into one of the several exclusions from the unrelated business income tax. So that's another thing to use to your advantage. And then finally, there's a structure. Um, how do you actually arrange the activity to limit your exposure to the tax? Um, I mentioned the, uh, the purpose. Uh, one thing that an organization can do is before it's going to engage in an activity that may be outside of the scope of, of its exempt purposes, is to broaden those purposes. Quite simply, uh, this can be done via um, a change to your organizational document. You want to have the board engage, of course, and, and an understanding that this is, this is what you want to do. But if you broaden the scope of your activity to uh, envelop the activity, um, you will more than likely have avoided um, the risk of being taxed on uh, unrelated business income. There's a question. In broadening that activity, though, must it still be within the realm of the charitable scientific and other requirements? The question is, if you, if you broaden your activity, are you nevertheless restricted by the specific um, criteria for charitable organizations that are outlined in the tax code, and that is charitable, educational, scientific, literary? And the answer to that is yes. You, you, can, you can broaden it only so much. You can't go out outside of the specific uh, outline charitable purposes that are in, in the Internal Revenue Code. But with that said, there are uh, an, uh, a lot of activities that will still fit within the parameters of what are considered charitable. Um, you just want to make sure that there's a consistency to your approach to those activities. Uh, you always want to have, again, the, the Board of Directors should be involved when a decision is made to expand the scope of your activities. Another thing you should do, and this is a good question, is because when a charity receives its determination from the Internal Revenue Service, the, the Internal Revenue Service, as I mentioned before, will write you a, a nice letter that says congratulations, and they'll condition your, your exemption. They'll say, so long as you're doing what you told us you were going to do. So, if your activities are going to go beyond what you've outlined to the IRS, you really should let them know. And the, and the new 990 is structured so that you can actually do that in a tax filing. Otherwise, you can simply write them a letter, notify them of the changes to your articles, provide a copy of that amendment uh, to the Internal Revenue Service, and you will have um, done what you're supposed to do. Um, another way of limiting risk on, on the, the unrelated business income tax is to actually have a specific target date um, or dates around which you conduct your activity so that you can stay below this regularly carried on threshold. And uh, as Ann mentioned, this, that's, a, that's a facts and circumstances kind of test. The IRS won't say, for example, that if your activity only lasts a day uh, or two days, that you're automatically excluded from this regularly carried on requirement. Um, there are examples where you may engage in an activity in a seasonal uh, capacity. You may sell Christmas cards during the Christmas season. Well, if we go back to what the purposes behind the unrelated business income tax are and say, well, who else sells Christmas cards during the Christmas season? Well, that would be commercial card providers. And if you can do so and, and exempt yourself from it, um, then you've got an advantage. That said, you can structure your Christmas cards to be very, very charitably mission-oriented. Uh, so that the Christmas card, while it is a Christmas card or holiday card, um, is structured so that, yes, there's a, a season's reading about it. There's a mission component to it because you're raising awareness about what it is that your organization does. And that has been successfully uh, undertaken by organizations. Another way, and we've mentioned this uh, on several um, slides before, is to operate within one of the exclusions. So we know that there, there's a tax on, on revenues that are generated from unrelated business activities, but the, the sources of the revenues can dictate whether or not the money you receive is taxable. You can get dividends, interest, and annuity payments without having to pay tax. You can also get rent and royalties without having to pay tax. Just be careful 
with your rent, so that you don't have debt finance property. Um, and finally, the other, the, one of the, the large mitigation strategies is if you sense that your activity is going to cross a threshold, and uh, Ann mentioned that 15% is something that the tax practitioners will guide you toward, you could, should consider creating a taxable subsidiary so that the activity itself doesn't risk your, um, your loss of exempt status. You can carry it on, pay your tax on it, manage it separately in another organization that you control. And that would build funnel profits to your nonprofit, but that's a possibility. So finally, key points to consider if you're thinking about social enterprise, um, make sure you're going to weigh the risks and rewards. It's, it's not risk free. Um, but it, but it can be very a, a very uh, good idea for a lot of nonprofits. So before you do it, don't do it alone. Get professional guidance. Um, you can call Pro Bono Partnership, and they'll uh, connect you with somebody who can help you out. Um, but you need to, to go about it methodically um, and, and consider you know, consider before you actually do it. I have one last question. The viewer says that some nonprofits operate thrift stores. Do these cross the line in terms of unrelated business income tax if they're not using them to train clients or to have clients work there? The question was about um, nonprofits or tax exempt organizations out there that operate thrift stores. And um, there's, there's an exclusion out there I, I speak of often, and I call it the goodwill exclusion. You come across uh, stores where people donate their goods and those goods are then sold um, for um, a profit. Uh, you have an exception for that in the in the um, in the UBIT world. That is, if someone donates goods and you sell those, and that's that's what you use to generate revenues for your organization. That activity um, can be excluded from the, the tax on unrelated business income, but it's also um, available to an organization. And this may have been part of the question. Is if the volunteers are being trained, in other words, they you may, or I'm sorry, not the volunteers, but the employees. If you have employees in the enterprise who are pulled from a community that is distressed economically, and by virtue of the job opportunities you provide, you are training them to become um, active participants in the economy, then you also are furthering your exempt purpose in ride under the exclusion that, hey, this is a related activity, uh, even though we're selling things in our store. But um, two of the big exceptions that, that one can use are the volunteer, the donated goods exception, and the volunteer employee exception. So uh, as I mentioned in, in an early example where we had uh, sales of ice cream or something of that nature in an activity, if the labor is donated and the product is donated, your sales activity um, can be accepted or excluded from the tax on the way that they can That's all the questions. Thanks. Thank you. Well, if, if anyone who's, who's um, watched the webinar today would have more information about uh, the Pro Bono Partnership of Atlanta or wants to seek some more counsel, then uh, you can please contact them. Uh, the phone number is 404-407-5088. They also have a fax number at 404-853-8806. You can email a uh, question to info at pbpatl.org. And of course, you can always visit their website for more information and to download forms at www.pvp.org.